Hey everyone, today we're going to look at the eye and ear diseases and disorders. So before we actually get started on the actual diseases and disorders, let's do a brief review of the anatomy and physiology. So if we're looking at the anatomy and physiology of the eye, remember that this is the sensory organ that's located in the orbit of your skull, okay, so in your eye socket. We see that this particular structure is going to help you obviously with vision. That is the use of this sensory organ. Now, a couple of things we wanna kind of hit on when we look at this is if you look here, there are six muscles in each eye that help you move your eye. This allows you to take your eye and actually roll it all the way around. Okay, so those six uh, muscles, but those muscles are going to be communicated tube with multiple cranial nerves. Now, with the eye itself, there's a lot of cranial nerves that deal with allowing you to see, like we see with optic nerve, cranial nerve two. We see that there's a several that are going to help you with movement of the eye. We also see that you would use some of those cranial nerves for um, pain or sensations in your eye. So these different cranial nerves are helping give different functions to that eyeball. Now, when we look at the eye as well, you will see that there are some accessory structures that help keep the eye healthy. These include things like your eyelids, the lacrimal glands, which produce your tears. And when you blink your eyelids, they actually help move those tears across your eye. The part of the eye that those tears travel across are called the conjunctiva. This is why when we're going to talk in a little bit with conjunctivitis, it's that particular area of the eye that is inflamed. Other components of the eye that we see are the sclera. Now the sclera is the white part of your eye. It's this outer kind of tunic that goes around the eye. Part of that is also going to be the cornea. Okay, so the cornea is the very front part of your eye that you use to kind of see through. We also see that you have the iris. The iris is the colored part of your eye. In the iris, we're going to find a series of muscles that are going to help, and these are smooth muscles, that are going to help with the closing or opening of your pupil. So we would say either the constriction or dilation of your pupil, which is the actual hole through your eye. We also see that we have the eye divided into different chambers. This division is done by the lens. The lens is gonna help you focus what you see back onto the back of your retina, but it also is going to put your eye into two sections. The anterior chamber, which is up before or in front of the lens, and the posterior chamber, which is behind. Both of these chambers are filled with a type of liquid. The anterior chamber is filled with aqueous humor, and the posterior chamber is filled with a vitreous body, which is more of a gel-like substance than an actual liquid. Now, like I said, your lens is going to help you be able to accommodate and be able to see things a little bit better. It's going to move, and it's going to um, kind of almost like a ball where you, when you sit on it, it's going to put pressure on it versus it's going to... Um, versus relax in order for you to be able to focus on things. We also see that inside that sclera tunicate, that sclera layer, there's what we call the coracoid layer. This is the middle layer of your eye and it has a dark pigment in it, which helps absorb light. So the light's not just bouncing around inside of your eye. We also see that we have the retina. Now the retina, guys, is the part that's actually used for seeing. It's the part that contains the sensory nerves that we call rods and cones. They collect the information and they're the ones that send the signals to the optic nerve. So this is just a review of the structures of the eye. Now, how does it kind of work? Okay, how does the eye work? Well, when we look with the eye, we see that you have different fields, fields of vision. These fields of vision are going to be your nasal field, which are here in the middle, versus your temporal or your peripheral field out here to the side. Now, each eye is able to collect information. Some of that information is going to cross over to opposite sides of the brain through that optic chiasm that you see here, that X. That means that the information from like your nasal view over here, as well as your temporal view here, are all going to go to the same side. And your nasal view here and your temporal view here will go to the same side. This this helps give you a more 3D type image that you can see. Okay, so this is what gives you your depth perception and helps you with all of those different things with like visual coordination. 
We do see that the signals collected by your rods and cones do travel down the optic nerve. The optic nerve is then going to send that signal back to the occipital lobe. That is where the visual center of your brain is located, okay? And so it's going to travel from the front all the way to the back to be interpreted for what, what you actually see. All right, so now let's look at the anatomy and physiology of the ear. So when we look at the ear, guys, the ear has three kind of sections to it based on their location. You have the external part of the ear, which is the outer part. This is going to be the penna, which is the part that's the funnel that we see, and the auditory canal, which is the hole into your skull. This is going to go from the external towards the middle ear. This area is separated, the outside part, the external ear, and the middle ear by the tympanic membrane, also known as your eardrum. We then see that we have your middle ear. Your middle ear is going to also be known as the tympanic cavity. It is behind your eardrum and it is going to be filled with some fluid. It's one of the smallest synovial joints that you have because inside this cavity, this little opening in your temporal bone, there are three small bones called the, male the malleus, the stapes, and the incus. These three bones form a series of joints that are super small, but they move when they vibrate based on sound coming in. So these are the smallest bones in your body and they have the smallest synovial joints because they do move. We then see that we're going to move from the middle ear to the inner ear. The inner ear is the most sophisticated part of this structure. It's going to have several areas. We have this vestibule area that opens up from the middle ear into that inner ear. There's also these structures called the semicircular canals, which are filled with fluid as well as little hairs. And that fluid runs across them. And this is what helps you keep your equilibrium and your balance. When you mess up your inner ear, that's one reason why a lot of times you might feel dizzy. We also see that there is this round window, which is almost like a second tympanic membrane. And as that, that series of small bones the, what, that we call the ossicles, the, the malleus, the stapes, and the incus, incus move, we see that they are going to hit that round window, which is that second tympanic membrane, and that's going to push that fluid that's in your inner ear. This fluid is found in the cochlea, which is that rounded part, looks kind of like a snail shell, and that's going to be the actual organ of hearing. A lot of times we also call it the organ of cordy. Inside there, there's a series of, again, these little hair-like fibers that move as fluid comes around due to the vibrations of sound. That is then going to be converted into an electrical impulse and travel down cranial nerve 8, which is the vestibular cochlear nerve. All right, so let's just take a look at the picture that we see here. You have the external ear from the auricle or pinna through that auditory canal. The separation is the tympanic membrane to that middle ear. That middle ear has the malleus, which is also known as the hammer, the incus or the anvil, and the stapes or the stirrup. Those small bones vibrate in that fluid in order to then send the signal into the inner ear. You can see the semicircular canals up towards the top, and of course the cochlea, which looks like that snail shell there. We also see that you can see the branches of the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve eight. All right, so let's look at some common signs and symptoms that we see with either eye disorders or ear disorders. So let's look at eye disorders first. A lot of times when the eye has a problem, we find that it will be painful, and there may be a burning in or around the eye itself. We also see that visual acuity or the ability to see starts to suffer. Hey, okay, it doesn't get better, it gets worse. So visual acuity or the ability to see is affected in a negative way. Now, any disorder um, may have certain specific things that makes that ability to see tougher. It might be that they have these like flashes of lights that you see. It might cause halos around something. It may be whenever um, a part of the vision is clouded or uh, dark. So there's a number of different reasons why visual acuity or the ability to see would be hindered. We also see the eye itself may have some redness. Now for ear disorders, it's a little bit different. We do see that there can be ear pain there could be ear pain as otalgia. We also see that there could be a type of deafness that takes place. Vertigo, which is where the room kind of feels like it's spinning. And in this case, it's not necessarily due to the fact that you, you know, spun yourself around and now the room is spinning. It's even in the, the place whenever you haven't done something like that. 
Or also we could have a ringing in the ears, which is known as tinnitus. So that ringing of the ears could be due to like a loud noise or it could be something that's just happening within the, the ear because of the damage that's done. All right, so let's look at some diagnostic tests, okay? Now these are obviously gonna be different for your eye and your ear because they are um, different sensory organs. They do different jobs. So when we look at the eye, one of the main things you're gonna notice is a lot of these diagnostic tests are done at the eye doctor, okay? And so going to see the eye doctor a lot of times is that first step when you start to see that there may be problems and then you may have to be referred to an actual you know, eye surgeon or something like that if things have to be addressed in that way. So when you go to the ophthalmologist or the eye doctor, they may use what we call an ophthalmoscopy, which is a type of machine that goes in and looks inside of your eye. We also see that they will do a visual acuity test. That's like what you see here with the letters where they're going to ask you if you can read the letters. They also might go through the process when you do need glasses or contacts where they'll go with that whole idea of which one's better, one or two, three or four. And that, of course, is going to help you be able to tell um, if the vision is decreasing in its acuity or, um, or not. They may also do an eye pressure test, which is called tonometry. They also will do the slit test. The slit test is where they're going to have you um, look a lot of times at the doctor's ear. They're going to look through a special lamp, and a lot of times it has like a purplish color to it. What they're doing there is they're looking for like corneal abrasions, keratitis, cataracts, that sort of thing. And then they also may do an angiography where they're looking at the blood vessels actually in the retina of your eye. On the ear side, a lot of times the main way that they will test or look at the inside parts of your ear is through an, uh, an otoscope. Okay, so that's where they're going to put it in and they're going to look through and look mostly just at the canal of the ear as well as the tympanic membrane. But they may also want to test your hearing with what we call an autometry test. And the, this is going to be where they play different sounds. They're going to ask you if you can hear it in one ear versus both ears. Um, so there's a series of tests that can be done with that to actually test your hearing. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive into the disorders of the eyes first, and then we'll get into the disorders of the ears. So when we look at the eye, there could be some issues with just how your eyes refract. There could be an error or a problem, and this is the inability of you to be able to focus images on your retina properly. Now there could be a number of reasons for this. It could be that there's a problem with your lens, your cornea, your um, eye shape might be different or um, not the normal your eye shape might be a little weird and so because of this it does not focus on the back of the eye on the retina like it's supposed to like you see in this first picture in some cases we see that the image would focus before the retina if that happens that's called myopia myopia. Myopia is also known as nearsightedness and this is where the light rays focus in front of the retina. Now people that are nearsighted they can actually see up close. That's what it talks about. They're nearsighted but they cannot see very well far away so they have an issue with that. The other side though is it could start to make it where it focuses behind the retina. If it's trying to focus where at a distance behind the retina, we call this hyperopia. Hyperopia is known as farsightedness, and this means you normally can see things far away just fine, but up close you start to have an issue. So these would be individuals who need reading glasses. Now, you might find people, as they get older, that they have issues with both of these. That's when they need bifocals, okay? And so bifocals is part of that. Now guys, presbyopia is very similar to hyperopia, but presbyopia is age-related, meaning that it's gonna happen to all of us. As we age, we see that being able to see up close starts to decrease. This is why older individuals, you'll start to see where they'll like look with their arms. They'll take like, say their phone or something and they're doing this number. All right, oh, where's that sweet spot to look at it? That is because they have what we call presbyopia. And guys, this can start as early as the age of 30. Okay, we see a decline in our visual acuity, whether you have glasses or not, which I've had glasses since kindergarten. But whether you've had them or not, you'll see that your eyes will decrease as you age. We also see that there's something that's called astigmatism that can affect 
how you see. This is an irregularity in your corneal surface and used to people with astigmatism couldn't wear contacts because the contacts were not made for those irregular type surfaces. However, contacts have progressed and they are available to individuals with astigmatism today. So guys, one of the earlier treatments to kind of correct myopia specifically was what we would call a radial uh, curtonomy. This particular place is where they would go in and they would um, go on each side of the cornea and they'd stretch the cornea instead of actually lasering off layers. But this is quickly being replaced with some of these other treatments, especially the laser type treatments that are going to be talked about. So we see the automated lamular keratoplasty. This is going to be a surgery using a device called a microcurtome to separate and remove thin discs of the cornea. So the thickness of these discs can be determined and removed based on helping you with your vision. We also see you can do the laser assisted and this is known as Lasix, okay, where they go in with the laser and be able to shave parts of those off. We also see that uh, something similar would be the photo refract, refract, the photo refractive procedure. This is where the top layer of epithelial cells of the cornea is removed um, before we can actually go in and sculpt the cornea. They might use implantable contact lenses to help the patient. These are permanently putting contact lenses in. We can see conductive keratoplasty. This is a surgery using kind of mild heat from radio waves to shrink some of the connective tissue or the collagen in the eye around the cornea to tighten it up. Um, again, there could be some other laser type treatments when we look at this with the eight. H Lasix. This one's a little different because it's going to loosen the surface area around the cornea and pushes it to the side. The laser then can reshape the inner part of the cornea itself. There's also thermal keratoplasty. This one is going to be where they use heat to change the shape of the cornea. Or we could do a monovision type of surgery, which is going to adjust or fit one eye to see at a distance, or sorry, fit one eye to see at a distance. And so you can see far away and the other eye would be programmed to see up close. And so that's why they call it monovision because one's been corrected for far away and one's been corrected for up close. That does not work for everybody. Okay. But it is something that could be done. But the main key here, guys, is if you wanted to fix this more permanently, besides wearing glasses or contacts, it would be doing a type of LASIK procedure. There's just different options out there. All right, so now let's talk about some inflammation and infections that can happen in the eye. So the first one we want to hit on is called conjunctivitis. Conjunctivitis is going to be inflammation because anytime we have itis on the end of the word, it means inflammation. This is going to be inflammation of the conjunctiva itself. This inflammation could be due to a number of things. It could be a bacterial infection. It could be a viral infection, but it could also just be due to um, an allergy or exposure to wind, or the cold, or even heat. The sun might even cause this in some individuals. So not all conjunctivitis, guys, is contagious, and that's important to know. But regardless, no matter what caused the conjunctivitis, the individual has excessive tearing, itching, burning, and pain in their eye. The treatment for this is going to be like a warm compress to help with redu reducing some of that pain as well as inflammation, anti-inflammatories, analgesics, which are kind of like pain medication or pain drops, and perhaps antibiotic ointment, but only if the cause is a bacterial infection. The prevention, guys, though, of pretty much any type, when we're especially talking about viral or um, bacterial, is good hand hygiene. If we can keep our hands clean and we're not touching our eye and things like that, even with allergens, that can help prevent some of this um, conjunctivitis. The next one is called blepharitis. Blepharitis is inflammation of the edge of the eyelid, eyelash follicles, and glands. Okay, so this isn't actually like really in the eye. It's kind of the edge of the eyelid that's right around the eye. Now, this can be caused by bacterial infections, allergic reactions, or it could be caused by seborrhea. This is going to be things like disorders of the glands where the, the oil glands do not produce the oil like they're supposed to and they kind of get clogged up. 
Now, allergic reactions could be due to like smoke, dust, certain chemicals that will normally trigger some of this. Now, symptoms, you'll see that the eye is red, swollen, and you'll have crusty eyelids because the issue is actually on the eyelid itself with a lot of those glands that normally would help produce a type of oil for your eyelashes. Now, treatment. If it's a bacterial reaction or infection, antibiotics are used. If it's allergies, we would want to maybe take an allergy medication or a type of eye drop to help with this. And if it's going to be the actual glands themselves getting clogged up and not doing their job, we might want to tr do treatments for that, which are things like lotions, creams, um, just to help that whole idea of lubricating those areas so that maybe these particular glands don't have to work as hard. The next one that we see is keratitis. Keratitis is inflammation of the cornea, and this is caused by either trauma to the eye or a type of infection. My husband actually has keratitis, and it's due to infection of a herpes virus. It's the same herpes virus that causes cold sores in um, your mouth, but instead, somebody kissed him right next to his eye when he was a baby who had a cold sore and the virus transferred. He now doesn't get cold sores in his mouth. He gets them in his eye. Okay. Now, usually this is unilateral only on one side. In rare cases, you do see that it is in both. Symptoms are going to be things like photophobia. They do have a very high sensitivity to light when there is this outbreak that happens or even just on a daily basis because of the refraction that happens due to their cornea being clouded and scarred. There's also pain and excessive tearing. Now treatment might be antibiotic ointment or drops. Um, a lot of times with trauma we would also use this because we want to help prevent further infections. Analgesics are a big thing for painkilling you know, getting rid of the pain and even eye patching again with help with the photophobia or the light. If it's a viral infection like my husband's, acyclovir is a really good uh, medication to take and that's just to help decrease the viral replication. And so it helps keep his outbreaks a little bit lower and where it's not scarring up that cornea as much. But if you'll notice, there's a cloudiness that happens on the cornea here and blood vessels start to travel into the cornea to help deal with the infection. Blood vessels aren't supposed to be in the cornea. So this can cause some more vision issues for that particular patient. The next one we see is a sty. A sty is also known as a hordulum. This is an inflammatory infection of the sebaceous glands of the eyelid. Okay, so it's an inf inflammatory infection where the actual gland in the eyelid is infected. It is similar to a pimple. It is normally caused by staphylococcus bacteria, which is normally what causes the infection in a pimple. Now, treatment is normally a warm compress that's to help pull some of that infection out. And then we may need to look at some topical or systemic antibiotics, depending on how severe the problem is. And styes are pretty painful. They're not going to necessarily be like super contagious, but they're pretty painful because they sit right there on the where the eyelid closes. The next one we want to look at is a cataract. A cataract is actually a clouding of the lens. This causes a change. Um, some of the causes for cataracts are a change in metabolism and nutrition that's happening towards the lens. So the lens isn't getting the nutrition it's supposed to get. The aging process is going to lend to cataract development. So this is why you see a lot of times older individuals will have cataracts. However, there is also in rare cases congenital diseases where cataracts are um, present when a child is born. Now, symptoms of a cataract, because there's this cloudiness that's happening on the eyelid, we see decreased visual acuity. So instead of looking through a clear surface like saran wrap, you're looking more through like wax paper. And you can see that here in this picture of looking into like the cabinet. There's areas that are fine, but the part where the cataract's covering is very clouded. You can't see what's going on there. Now, treatment. One of the main treatments is lens replacement surgery, where they may go in and they will might they might get the cataract to be removed 
from that particular area of the lens. A lot of times I have to go in and just kind of take it off. Other times they need to replace it all together. Now the lens like the cornea is a vascular. So replacement of this is not that big of a deal. You're not going to have a big chance of rejection to take place when you get a new one and you don't really have to worry about bleeding. So this is a very like in and out surgery and most hospitals, they actually will have cataract, um, days where they'll have see 30 patients where they will help remove these cataracts. They will do these cornea type replacements, these lens replacements, just boom, 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 because the procedure is very easy and there's no bleeding normally that takes place normally. The next thing we want to look at is glaucoma. Glaucoma is characterized by an excessive eye pressure. Okay, so because we have fluid in your eye, your eye has a set of pressure that's in there. This is why sometimes when you have headaches, you might feel that the pressure around your eye is different, that sort of thing. But glaucoma is where there's a slow progression with or without symptoms where the pressure in the eye starts to gradually increase. Okay, and so because of this, it starts putting pressure on the retina, on the optic nerve, and it could ultimately start to affect vision. Now, permanent damage can occur even before symptoms come to play. And so a lot of times permanent damage has already happened before the patient actually feels pain or has any other symptoms that leads the, us to knowing that it was glaucoma. So this is one reason why going to the eye doctor can be important because they can check for this as well. Now, what causes this to have an increased pressure is remember I talked to you about how the fluid in the eye, especially that aqueous humor in the front part, it's supposed to be made and drained. That's the whole point. It gets made, it gets drained, it gets made, it gets drained, and the pressure should stay relatively constant. But for whatever reason, when we look at patients with glaucoma, they are either making too much of this fluid or the fluid's not draining properly. Either way, the pressure starts to increase. So this can lead to blindness. It does cause damage to the optic nerve and we see that the pressures need to be checked in the eye eyes on a regular basis. So what is the treatment for glaucoma? Well, eye drops might be helpful to help get some of that pressure off as well as surgery. Surgery might need to be done to relieve the pressure. Now glaucoma, when it gets to those very severe cases, it is very painful due to the extra pressure in the eye. The next eye disorder we want to look at is called nystagmus. Nystagmus is a constant involuntary movement of the eyes. So it can affect one eye or both. But what happens is, is when you focus on something, your eyes should focus on it with no movement. But with nystagmus, they start to actually quiver and move very, very quickly. Now, the causes of nystagmus could be things like the patient could have a brain tumor, other types of diseases like Meniere's disease or multiple sclerosis, alcohol abuse could con cause this, but it could also be a congenital defect where the child is just born with it. The main treatment is to correct the underlying cause. If we cannot correct the underlying cause or we don't know what the underlying cause is, like with congenital defects sometimes, there's not a whole lot we can do with it. A lot of times the nystagmus starts to get worse, especially when the patient starts to get tired. The next one is strabismus. Strabismus is where the eyes fail to focus in the same direction. And a lot of times we would say that this has a, a child who is cross-eyed, not since because the eyes are not focusing in the same place. This is normally due to muscle weakness in either one or both of the eyes. We do see that it can cause things like dipoplia, which is double vision for the patient. We also see that it causes sometimes their brain not to listen to both eyes, not to take the information from both eyes, and maybe one eye starts to get weaker and the optic nerve starts to atrophy. This can ultimately affect the child or person's vision. Now, amblyopia is also present in some cases here, and this is a decrease in vision of the affected eye that is crossing. And a lot of times we term that when we talk about amblyopia, we call that a lazy eye. Well, what's treatment? If it's one eye, a lot of times what they'll do is they'll cover the eye that's stronger, the normal eye. And you're thinking, why would they cover the normal eye? Well, this forces the weaker eye to actually have to be used and focus on things, All right? So it's forcing it to be used and have to focus and it strengthens those muscles in the process. We also see that they could be doing eye exercises to help. 
They may need corrective lenses to help in this process. And then surgery can also be done. Surgery could be done where we clip the stronger muscle in that particular eye and we realign the eye to hopefully then help retrain it in that process. The next eye one we want to look at is called macular degeneration. Now, macular degeneration is something that happens with age, okay? It is the most common age-related eye illness that we have or disorder. This is degeneration of a specific area on your retina called the macula, okay? And you can see it here in this picture where these yellow dots are becoming present. That is where macular degeneration is occurring. Now, the macula is your most acute area of your vision. It's the central point of your vision. So symptoms are loss of that central vision. So if you saw the picture here, normal vision, you could see these two kids' faces because that's normally what you would focus on when you look at these children. If you do that with somebody who has macular degeneration, those faces are gone. That part of their vision is not there. Now, the main type of treatment for macular degeneration is going to be laser surgery, and this is just to help try to improve vision. There are new medications out that they're trying to use for this, as well as having the patient eat foods that are high in antioxidants. Um, we may see that they need to wear sunglasses and UV protection that might help decrease or slow this process. Risk factors for developing macular degeneration besides just aging is if you have, if you're farsighted, you have light eye color, that tends to be where you're more sensitive to the sun and all, which can cause this damage to your macula and also cigarette smokers. The next one we want to look at is diabetic retinopathy. This is the leading cause of blindness in the United States. And just like the name tells you, this is going to be due to uncontrolled diabetes. This is when diabetes mellitus causes vascular or blood vessel changes in the retina. Because these blood vessels are no longer able to supply the retina with the oxygen and the nutrients and the removal of waste like it's supposed to, we see that it starts to decrease the retina's ability to do its job, its visual acuity. So we see that it's kind of like where the, the retina is dying in a sense and it's not able to complete its job. Now, a lot of times we see here there's going to be like micro breaks that happen, bleeds within the retina. These are called micro hemorrhages. When this happens, we do see new little blood vessels come out to try to fix this, but these blood vessels are very weak and they build them quickly so the quality is not very good. So then they can rupture even more. Treatment is going to be what we call a laser photocoagulation. This works by... This will work with the whole idea of some of these micro hemorrhagings, but we do see that they will reoccur and this treatment has to be continually done. Prevention is controlling the blood sugar. Guys, having diabetes does not mean you definitely get this. But if we do not control our blood sugars as a diabetic, we see that it increases our risk of so many other things, including losing our eyesight. And so it's really important that those sugars are constantly monitored and controlled in diabetics. The last eye kind of disorder I want to talk to you about here is colorblindness. Now, colorblindness is not one of these that's like life threatening in this case. Um, it doesn't even necessarily change the quality of the life of the individual very often because most of the time the person is born colorblind. So they don't even realize kind of what colors they're missing out on a lot of in a lot of cases. But this is also called color vision deficiency or CVD. This happens in one in 10 males. And the reason why it is more common in males is because it, color vision is found on the X chromosome. In females, there are two X's. And so because of that, even if a female has a defective gene for color blindness, they normally have a backup copy. So they do not develop this as often. They have to have two affected copies in order to be color blind. Whereas males, because they are XY, one X being messed up means that they are colorblind. Now, this is the ability to see color that diminishes and it will get worse a lot of times with age. And this is due to a yelling, yellowing of the lens that happens as well. So even though they start with being colorblind in a certain way, they it will start to get worse as they age a lot of times. Now, this is an inherited disorder, meaning you get it from your parents and it's found on that X chromosome. 
The most commonly thing that's affected is that they cannot distinguish between red and green. We call this red green color blindness, but it could be any other shades and they could actually be completely colorblind as well where they just see the world in black, white, and gray. But red green color blindness is the most common and so a lot of times they'll use a test like you see here which is the dot test where they use different types of red and green dots to see if you can see a number. Okay so in this case the number when we look at it is 74. If you cannot see that you might have an issue with your red green color distinction. Now there is no cure for color blindness. Um, the big thing is that we do things to help cope with color blindness. Uh, people who are colorblind, and even if they can't distinguish between red and green, they can still drive because if we look at the um, stoplights with the red, yellow, green, they're always in the same order. So instead of them learning the color, they learn the location. Okay, and so there's a lot of different modifications that have been done around the world that you may not even realize that are for individuals who are colorblind. All right, so now let's get into the infections or disorders of the ear. Okay, so the first one here is, is otitis media. Now the otitis tells you it's the ear, media tells you it's the middle ear. So this is inflammation in the middle ear that's happening. It usually affects infants and young children. Guys, this is what we normally term as an ear infection. When a kid goes to the doctor and they say, oh, he has an ear infection, this is what they're talking about. Now there are different types. There's what we call this serous type of um, odious media. This one is going to be where there's mostly clear fluid that is causing the issue for the ear. Um, the other one is the superative. This one is going to be due to pus and that's a bacterial infection that is occurring. Now one of the easiest ways to diagnose this is that they go in with the otoscope, they look at the eardrum and if it is inflamed, if it is distended and very tight, then there's pressure normally behind that eardrum. Now depending on what kind of fluid that we might see with it depends on how we might treat this. But guys, one of the most common causes is a type of infection, whether it's viral or bacterial, because the middle ear is connected to the throat through the astuchian tube. That tube is a gateway for things to go from a child's throat into their ear and cause an ear infection to occur. As we get older, that tube is a little more steep and it does not give access as well in adults as it does children. So this is why you don't see as many ear infections in adults as we do with children. Now, when we see treatment, treatment is gonna be painkillers, a lot of times decongestants because it's an issue decongestants because it's an issue a lot of times with a head cold that's causing problems with this and also antibiotics if it is bacterial. Now, if a child has chronic ear infections, they chronically have a buildup of fluid behind their tympanic membrane, their eardrum, we might need to go in and actually put in tubes. What they do here is they put a small slit in the tympanic membrane and they insert this little tube. It's like a silicone type tube. What this does is it helps relieve the pressure by allowing the fluid to drain out of the ear. Okay, now this is better than our eardrum rupturing due to the pressure because if it ruptures or breaks, it will heal, but it'll heal with scar tissue. Scar tissue does not work like normal tissue, so it would affect the child's hearing. In this case, because we're doing a surgical incision, the area is going to close up very easily and very nicely once the tube is removed. And a lot of times, guys, after after the child has like not had infections for a while, it will actually push the tube out on its own and you'll find it a lot of times on their pillow. It'll just come out of their ear and then that tympanic membrane will heal up. There are some preventative things that you can do, especially for babies to help prevent ear infections. One of the main ones is how you feed the child. The child needs to be fed at an angle, holding the angle, especially if you are bottle feeding. When you breastfeed a child, they're already at an angle and so there's not as much of that problem. But if you're bottle feeding, convenience wise, a lot of times we want to like lay the baby down and prop up the bottle. If the baby's laying flat, that puts them at a higher risk of developing ear infections, okay? So not feeding a baby supine, flat, is very important to help prevent these. 
Now, another type of ear infection is the outer part of the ear. So this is the odious externa, the outer part. This is also known as swimmer's ears because a lot of times uh, swimmers deal with this due to being in the water a lot. Sometimes the water has fungus or bacteria, but a lot of times it could be due to the chemicals if they're in a pool like the chlorine. This is inflammation of the external ear canal, and it's a lot of times caused by bacterial or fungal infections. Symptoms when we look at this are going to be extreme ear pain, they'll have fever, and they'll have pruritus. This is a type of itchiness inside of the ear. Um, some other symptoms are things like hearing loss or clear or purulent drainage. Now, the purulent drainage is going to be seen a lot of times if your immune system is trying to fight that bacteria or fungus, and that's the pus that gets created. Now, when we look at this, treatment, keep your ear canal clean and dry. Now, this does not mean clean your ears with Q-tips. Q-tips are just going to push stuff further down into your ear. You should put nothing smaller than your finger in your ear. Okay, that means you don't put anything in there. One of the main ways that you can kind of clean out your ear canal is to use hydrogen peroxide or rubbing alcohol. Now, this doesn't mean turn your head and pour a ton down into your ear. A few drops will do, but this will help clear out some of the earwax as well as any fungal or bacterial type of products that may have gotten into your ear. Analgesics might be needed so for the pain and then antibiotics if it is a bacterial infection. Mastoiditis is another thing that deals with your ear. The mastoid process is right behind your ear. It's that bump you can feel right behind your ear. Mastoiditis is inflammation of that bony process. And acute mastoiditis usually results after an inner ear infection because your middle ear infection, sorry, your middle ear infection is right there next to it. And so if it spreads out of that like more localized area, it could be a complication. Um, and actually due to this being a problem with bacterial infections in that middle ear, this was the leading cause of death in children before antibiotics came onto the scene and started making this less likely, a less likely complication. Now, symptoms are tinnitus, so that ringing of the ear. We also see otalgia, which is the pain of the ear itself. Treatment is going to be antibiotics, but we also might need to do a mastodectomy, meaning they take out that infected part of the bone. Because guys, once a bone gets infected, it's a whole lot harder to treat. This is why a lot of times when people get with bone infections in their toes and things like that, amputation is the main thing that happens. If a bone gets infected, it's a lot harder to treat and we might just need to remove the infected bone tissue. The next thing I want to talk about is deafness. Now, guys, deafness affects more than 25 million people. There are different types of deafness. There is what we call conductive deafness and sensory deafness. Now, with conductive deafness, this is caused by external or middle ear disorders. So this is the front part of the ear being the issue. And this is where they cannot conduct sound as well as they used to or as well at all in the sense that they can't send the waves in. So this might be a tympanic membrane issue. This might be an ossicles issue. This could be a buildup of ear earwax. So some examples are impacted cerumen, which is earwax, osteosclerosis, which is when those three ossicles, those little bones that are supposed to be able to vibrate can't because of arthritis. Yes, you can get arthritis in your ears or even a ruptured eardrum. The conduction does not occur, and so because of that, we need to have help. This is a conduction type of deafness. On the other hand, there is what we call sensory deafness. Sensory deafness is when it's an inner ear problem. So this is the cochlea, um, cochlea is part of the issue, or the actual auditory nerve, cranial nerve eight. So the cochlea or auditory nerve is damaged, preventing it from sending what it's been able to detect sound wise to the brain. This can be caused due to damaging noise levels, like noise is being super, super loud for too long. This is why it's super important. You don't listen to your music super loud in your headphones, because when you're young, it might not cause any issues. But as you age, it could be a big problem. Also, there are different medications out there and not just medications for your ears, but different medications on the market that are ototoxic, meaning they do damage to your inner ear. So you have to be careful sometimes of how those are prescribed or how those are taken. So we're going to talk a little bit 
about a few of these. The first one is the impacted cerumen or the earwax. Cerumen is a soft yellow brown secretion. Again, we call it earwax. Um, it could be due to skin dryness, excessive hair that's inside of the ear. Um, your narrowing ear canal could be a problem if you have a small canal or excessive dust could cause issues here. Treatment is ear irrigation. Now we can do this with fluid where they can put in and they put the fluid in there and it pulls some of it out. In other cases, if you go to the doctor, they may use something that has like a little hook that helps pull it out. Hey, okay? there's some of those candles that you can use. There's a lot of different things that are out there, uh, but be careful sticking anything into your ear because it ultimately could do damage to your eardrum. Another one that causes some of that hearing loss is that um, otosclerosis. Otosclerosis is where there's a bony fixation in the middle ear. This is due to arthritis. This makes it where they cannot vibrate like they're supposed to. And the main treatment here is doing a stapedectomy. It's the smallest joint replacement that they can do. They go in and they replace the stapes. Okay, they replace the stapes with an artificial stapes and clean out a lot of the calcified buildup in that middle part of the ear. Now guys, with sensory neural deafness, this is a sensory deafness that's due to damage to the cochlea or the auditory canal, or uh, sorry, the auditory nerve. Uh, this is damage might be due to exposure to loud noises and the damage is often permanent. It cannot be reversed, especially if it's that auditory nerve, because when we're talking about nerves, guys, or neurons in general, if they're damaged, it is very difficult to like kind of revive them. Neural tissue dies, we can't really replace it. And so this is going to be where there's kind of lots of issues against that neuron. It gets damaged and it cannot repair itself. Perspicuous is a progressive sensory deafness, and this is related to age based on what we've done to our ears throughout the years. Symptoms usually begin after the age of 50. So this is why older individuals have problems with hearing you. So what's the way that we need to address them? Do not yell at them. Okay, um, that doesn't help the issue. What you need to do when you're speaking to somebody who's hard of hearing is you need to face them, have them look at you, and you need to speak slowly and clearly. Another thing is, is if you're a woman, a lot of times we have a higher register voice, like a higher pitch. Those are harder to hear. So if you talk in a deeper tone, it might sound funny to you, but it will be beneficial for your patient if you go down into a lower register so they can hear you better. It seems kind of silly, but it helps a lot. Okay. Another thing that these patients might have is they might use hearing aids to help amplify the sound. All right. The next thing is motion sickness. Now motion sickness is where you're going to experience nausea. And a lot of times it's when you're traveling in a car, boat, or airplane. And it's due to the fact that your eyes are tricked. Your body doesn't seem like it's moving. When you look out there, you know you're moving. But because of that idea of that optical illusion along with that feeling of moving, but you can't tell if you're moving that well, um, it causes you to have symptoms of motion sickness. Now, this affects some people more than others. More people, Some people are more sensitive to this, but symptoms are things like nausea and vomiting, diaphoresis, which is sweating, or even vertigo where you feel like the room just starts spinning. Treatment is anti-motion sickness medication. This could be things like Dramamine. Um, these might be things like the little bracelets that help. There's a lot of different treatments out there. Rest is also a big thing. And then closing of the eyes, okay? Because if we can get the eyes out of there, sometimes it helps it better be better. In some patients, it actually makes it worse. So you have to be careful. But these are some, some potential helps for motion sickness. All right, so now I want to talk to you a little bit about trauma. And with trauma, we're going to hit on both eye and ear trauma when we're looking at this. And so trauma first, when we look at the eye, is corneal abrasions. This is where the cornea itself gets kind of scratched or hurt in the process of some sort of traumatic event. So this could be like obstructive, uh, something uh, trapped between your eyelid and your cornea. It could be as small as a speck of dust, a uh, piece of sand, um, ill-fitting or worn contact lenses when you have it where they are not fitting correctly or they're old and they have tears in them. It might cause in a corneal abrasion. If you accidentally poke your eye, okay, 
<laughs> you put your finger in your eye. That happens sometimes with kids. Even as adults, it might happen. Extreme light. Like when people weld. That's why welders have a special shield or um, safety equipment. And the whole point is that intense light, if they're staring at it, it can actually cause issues to their cornea. Now, the main thing when we're looking at this is treatment is removal of the obstruction. If whatever is in the eye, we want to try to flush it out. Antibiotic ointment and painkillers might be helpful. Uh, pressure dressing to prevent eye movement because the more you move the eye, the more the longer it's going to take to heal. So we might need to cover the eye and reduce the photophobia pain, the light. And again, if we can cover the eyes, we can help reduce the light. Now, guys, when we talk about eye issues, if a patient especially comes in and is having has had eye trauma and they're going to be in the hospital for a while, one of the things is that they can still be pretty self sufficient, but they might need some help in like locating things okay they can still probably feed themselves but they might need some help so if a tray is brought out you might give instructions based on like the face of a clock okay because the clock doesn't ever change a lot of people don't know their directional terms like with north south east west so don't worry about using those um, a lot of people will say oh do it like a map well what map what map are you going to use for that? So that doesn't really work. The best thing is with the face of the clock because you can tell them, hey, your drink is at two o'clock. So they know that it's up in the top kind of right hand side of their tray. OK, you could tell them your silverware is over more at nine o'clock. OK, that's over here on the left on the actual side. OK, so sometimes that would be beneficial. Now, of course, little kids, that might be a little harder because they might not know about a clock. But as an adult, a face of a clock is a good way to try to help try to help with directions. Another thing that can happen that is a trauma and it's a medical emergency is retinal detachment. This often occurs when there's trauma in the eye, somebody who's diabetic, or other type of retinopathies or problems with the retina. This is where the retina starts to detach from the choroid. It starts to pull away. This causes the patient to have blurred vision in that particular area, flashes of light, floating spots, and then it starts to darken and go black. This is a painless disorder. There is no pain when this occurs, but it is a medical emergency because if it, it does not get attention right away, blindness will occur. The treatment for this might be surgery to put back the retina. They may also put in a bubble. They may put a bubble in that posterior cavity and that bubble would help push and kind of um, iron out that area of the retina that has been pulled away. Another thing that needs to be addressed when we look at the issue with the ear of trauma is a ruptured tympanic membrane. If your eardrum has ruptured, causes could be due to a middle ear infection that put too much pressure and it busted the eardrum or sticking sharp objects into the ear canal. Another thing is also if you box someone's ears, like you come over here and put high pressure in, that could, that could also cause a ruptured um, eardrum symptoms it is very painful they will have some partially lost hearing until that eardrum is repaired and there will probably be bloody or purulent discharge after the eardrum has ruptured treatment is antibiotics surgical patching of the membrane with tissue graft um, because scar tissue could affect the hearing we would maybe want to graft the area so it's not as big of a scarred part of that tympanic membrane all right, the last little section besides just how age affects our hearing and uh, vision, I want to talk to you a little bit about some rare diseases. One of the rare diseases is called retinoblastoma. This is a hereditary cancer. It's a malignant tumor of the eye that happens during infancy and childhood. It is fatal if it's left untreated because it is so close to the brain and it can metastasize to the brain. What we see here is a lot of times it is detected through pictures in kit with kids. One of the things we see when we use a camera, especially with a flash, is a lot of times it creates what we call red eye, okay, where you are seeing the reflection of the retina and that gives you that red color. If the child's eye doesn't have that, one does and the other one doesn't, it has this other kind of glow to it, there could be a retinoblastoma in there. Now, treatment. The treatment is removal of the eyeball, enucleation, and a nucleation. You got to take that eyeball out. There's no way of really saving it. Okay, so we're going to take it out to help prevent the child from dying as a whole. 
we then will still do radiation and chemotherapy just to make sure that we get most of the cells or all of the cancer cells, if at all possible, because we do not want it to metastasize to the brain. Okay. And so the eye gets removed. A lot of times we can put in a glass eye, um, a prosthetic, that sort of thing. Hopefully it doesn't happen to both eyes, but in some cases it does. Another type of rare disease that we see is called Meniere's disease. Meniere's disease is a chronic disease of the inner ear. Um, we don't really know the cause. Okay. And so this is what makes it hard with treatment because we're not really sure what causes it. We do see the symptoms are of course the ringing in the ear the spinning with the vertigo, they'll have progressive hearing loss, and then they'll feel like their ear is really full, kind of like if you feel like you have water in your ear all the time, that's what they feel like. The attacks that they have may last for only a few hours where they're feeling these things, but they could also last several days. They'll go through periods where they feel fine and then periods where things get worse. So we call those remissions and exacerbations. Some treatments though, uh, medications to control the nausea when they have the vertigo. Uh, low sodium diet. One reason we think this low sodium diet might be helpful is because sodium attracts water. So the more sodium you have, the more water retention you have, which means that might be more fullness in the ear, which could cause more of the symptoms. So if we reduce the sodium, we reduce the water retention, that might help. Uh, diuretics to get extra fluid off of the patient, antihistamines, and even if they're, and if they're smokers, they need to stop smoking. Okay, that tends to make it worse. Uh, surgery might be necessary and guys the main surgery they'll do is they'll cut cranial nerve 8 so they'll cut the vestibular cochlear nerve this means the person would go deaf at least in that ear but in some cases these symptoms are so severe and debilitating the person cannot li live a normal life it would be better to cut that nerve in order to live a normal life just without hearing than to live in that state that they were at before so that is kind of the severe case, but it seems to be the one that helps the most. All right, last but not least, I want to talk to you a little bit about effects of aging. Guys, eyes and ears are going to decline as we age. Changes in the ability of your eyes to focus on near objects, detect different colors like their vibrance, uh, sensitivity to light, and your vision in general is all going to decrease. You have a hard time with that. You're not going to be able to see things as well up close. You're not going to be able to see all those bright colors as well as you used to. Your vision just starts to decrease. Glaucoma and cataracts start to increase with age. So the chances of bleeding glaucoma and cataracts increases. Another thing we see is called arcus sinilis, which you can see in the picture here. And it's where a gray ring starts to develop around the colored part of the eye. This ultimately also affects visual acuity and the eye's ability to be able to focus like it is supposed to. And again, these are things with age. With the ear, we see that there is a thinner and less flexible tympanic membrane that develops as we age and degenerative changes in our neurons, the bones in our middle ear because of like arthritis and the cochlea itself starts to become affected causing that age-related hearing loss. So these are just some of the different things that we can see that cause problems with our eyes and ears. If you have any questions, please let me know. Mm -hmm.